Um, all I have to offer you is a little bit of academic theorizing, for which I apologize. Um, the issue of ethics has been mentioned three times by three speakers so far as, as a key element of the formation of a profession, a key element of identity, in some respects an element that can exclude others from the profession, in other respects uh, an ideology that can bring people together. And the notion of ethics just includes many, many different things that I think we have to clarify to some extent. A, a lot of what we've been listening to here uh, concerns work conditions and they're, they're legitimate complaints and le legitimate problems but they would apply to any occupation in that situation. Perhaps the cleaners can make similar complaints. Perhaps legitimately as well. Okay? Um, and, and we leave them apart to a certain extent. I, I think it's important here in our reflections uh, if we're focusing on translators and interpreters to think about what is particular to these professions and not others. And I propose that that particularity has to do with first the nature of cross-cultural communication, working on particular kinds of cross-cultural cultural communication and there are others out there. That's why I asked David about the professions. I mean, language learning is one way of handling these problems. And, and the use of a lingua franca, the use of code switching, as was brought out there. There are other things that can be done. We have to think, well, what's specific about the work of translators and interpreters? The fact it's a third party brought in for a start. And the second thing that I, I, I want to insist on here is the necessity of trust. Almost by definition, but it doesn't apply to all cases, some party in the communicative interaction cannot control what the intermediary is doing and must trust them and must have some indications, some signal of trustworthiness. And that, I think, is one of the key things we should be looking at. It's, it happens in many other professions as well. The more technical the profession, the more trustworthiness comes in. Uh, so then again, there's no need to just close ourselves off to the wider view of the sociology of professions. I want to focus on the term intervention uh, because it's a very problematic term in relation to trust. Most of the professions we're talking about believe, as has been pointed out, that they are or should be neutral, objective, and not intervene. It's, it, it came out here. Although they recognize that it's difficult, the, the, the normative thrust of the ideology is this is what you should do. You should not intervene. And I think many of you who are doing empirical work have come up with this problem or against this problem. I, I've done in-depth uh, empirical research having lunch today and I, I spoke with Hannah about her recent translation of, of the Arabian Nights into Hebrew, which I find a fascinating project and I asked, quite naively of course, and did you intervene in the translation? And Hannah will not be embarrassed to admit that she said, no, I don't ever intervene in the text. I take them as they are. And you will get this in the interviews. In France, uh, we were talking about this, uh, that's the first response. That's the response they're supposed to give. That's the official code of ethics. And it's there in the codes of ethics. And then you ask, well, as I asked Hannah, uh, did you improve the text? No. Oh, yes. There were some little connectors and things that I put in. Ah, was that an intervention? Oh, but. Uh, and, and then the conversation went on. Uh, and, and we got, well, you know, are there really a thousand and one stories? Did, did you have to select the story? Who selected the Oh, I did a select. You selected the stories. Is that an intervention? And it's not hard to convince most translators that if you get down and discuss what they're really doing, particularly if they're actually editing as well, uh, the degree of intervention is quite great. It's not hard to pick at it, to do, you know, you do cunning questionnaires, as most of us can do, or you get 
the interview afterwards, as I did over lunch, and, and you can reveal this problematic act of intervention, which can be creative and improve the text and, and, and help people understand each other and all wonderful things, but will contradict the official ideology of neutrality, fidelity, equivalence in some translation theories. What do we here now want to say about that? This is one of the areas in which our discourses, the things we say, can have an influence on the things they say. And I'm aware that they are we. Many of us are practicing professionals as well. So it's not the outside and the inside, but it's the sides of us that are, are, are competing here. The connection, I think, goes from academic discussion such as we have, the profession such as we are, many of us, and training institutions as the big connector. Training as actually forming the, the modes of thought of future professionals. Uh, we are not useless, we can write codes of ethics, but more than that, we can train a lot of the future professionals and thereby do a lot to influence the profession. So we're going to do that, right? Are we going to let people intervene? That's the question. And the more technical question is, can intervention be ethical in some way? And I will answer that question. It's a very easy answer, but because I have to be academic and I have to make up some minutes, I'm going to go through seven bad ways of answering it before I answer it, okay? In doing so, you're going to get a brief update on what, for me, are the contemporary debates in translation studies, which might be interesting, but, well, I have an example. Um, the example um, comes from various translations of the long-forgotten and forlorn, soon to be unearthed, perhaps, Roadmap for Peace. Uh, and I'm drawing on uh, work by my former student, Ahmed Ayad, who looked at the Hebrew and Arabic translations of the American document and of other uh, peace proposals. So it's fascinating linguistic material with lots and lots of interventions on both sides. Uh, as soon as you get into the detail, you can't say one side is bad and the other is bad or good or whatever. Uh, funny things are happening within both languages. Three languages, but English here was the source text, so I can sort of follow what's going on. Here are three examples, and I use it to define what I mean by intervention, okay? Because it, the definition is important for what follows. <clears throat> the roadmap calls for normalization of relations. Uh, obvious translation problem, because normalization of uh, Israel's diplomatic relations with other countries, but also of uh, internal relations uh, within the future uh, solution. What is normal is incredibly different for each reader. And that term normalization has very different content according to the readerships. But the translators just put normalization. They had no need to intervene. It's a term that has to be interpreted, but the translators did not have to interpret it, if you see what I mean. Uh, I'm trying to get around this argument, which I'll meet in a minute, that says we are intervening all the time whether or not we want to do it. Well, no. Here's a translation problem. There are other things that could be done, but the literal rendition doesn't reduce the interpretations. It passes that on to future users of the discourse. It does not constitute intervention on the part of the translator. They do what is most obvious and what is l the least risky for them. Second interesting fact, the translation of the term roadmap into Hebrew is plural. It's the roads map. Okay, and into Arabic it's singular. It is the map of the road. So in Hebrew you are negotiating about plural roads, or might be negotiating one day, who knows. And in Arabic, you are seeking the one true road, which, as, as my informant says, 
in uh, Islam has religious connotations. You know, we'll be on the right path to, to whatever. Is that intervention? No, because my informants tell me that the Hebrew language obliges the plural to be there. So it's not an intervention by any translator saying, hey, there are really many possible roads. Okay, it's the nature of the language that obliges that, and you can get around that with added explanations if you want to then intervene. But following the language conventions, I don't think is what I want to call intervention in this particular place. Are you with me? Okay. Um, the uh, third major change, and this one occurs all over the place in the famous UN resolutions and the rest, is the uh, presence or omission of the article. Okay, so uh, we have uh, uh, translations here. Uh, removal of settle settlement outposts in English, the settlement outposts in Arabic. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, return, uh, recuperation of uh, all um, uh, Palestinian organizations, all the Palestinian organizations. The, the uh, Arabic uh, translations in this case insert an article which is not obligatory linguistically in order to claim that the part of English that, that could be read as some, okay, you return some of the land, you uh, return some of the uh, politi political organizations, but not all. In the Arabic translation, it is all. Okay? Uh, that, for me, is intervention. And I reflect on why I, I choose to call that intervention and not the other cases. Sorry, there are more examples, but I've just realized I'm going to be here for a long time. Uh, there are other examples, and it, it occurs to me that I would want to call intervention a situation, a shift, where the translator is aware of alternative possibilities, that is, they are not linguistically difficult to find uh, the alternative. Uh, there is a conscious refusal of alternatives, and it is for a conscious aim. That is not derived from the source text. That there is an aim, a purpose, a scopus, if you're from that side of the world, that is not derived from the nature of the source text. Now, if I can get those aims, purposes, scopoi, whatever you want to call them, and find out if they're ethical or not, I've solved the problem. Okay, are you with me? I'm solving the problem. No? Are you following? Because I, I'm here, I want the debate afterwards, that's why I'm here, so... Yeah, but are you following me? No. Of course you agree with me, don't you? It's obvious. Hypothetical agreement, you know, let's, it's for the sake of an argument, let's go this way. Okay, so... Um, uh, it's a shift uh, that is consciously made, it's a conscious refusal of alternatives for an aim uh, that can be stated, if, if pushed, if, if asked, okay? Such as the, uh, the, the Arabian Nights, you know, I asked, well, why did you do that selection? And, and an answer could be given. <coughs> That's fine, it's intervention. False arguments, number one. False argument. All texts are interpreted all the time. So we are intervening all the time, so there's no such thing as special intervention. Translation is always intervention. All right? Why is that not a good argument? Hmm. Um, I think I just did it by demonstrating that there is non-intervention. Okay, if, if I can allow that there is non-intervention, I gave, just gave you two examples, uh, I, I have deflated that argument that intervention is there all the time. Enough said. You with me? Good. Uh, you're against me? Okay, we'll come back to that. There's um, an another um, a version of that is that we're interpreting all the time. Uh, you can say, I choose to interpret this text the way I like. Okay, I have a right to my interpretation. I will interpret this text the way I like. Uh, and that solves a problem. No, it doesn't solve the problem, because that statement precludes communication. Uh, if you say, this is my interpretation, and that's what I'm going to translate, you forget that you're engaged in an, a communicative act with other parties. It can never be an entirely individual decision. 
that will never be entirely justified on individual criteria. Okay, individual, individual, individualistic interpretation precludes communication. I move on. Bad argument number two. That was one in two parts. It's a version of the same. Uh, uh, people say to the interpreters, to the translators, I'm sorry, I use translation as a general term, okay? Um, you must do what you think you is right. You, oh dear me, God, I've got to get this. You must do what you think is right. Okay, it's an existential approach to ethics. I can't tell you what is right for you. I can give you some things to think about, but you must decide. If it feels right for you, then you do it. Okay, and if you feel you have to intervene, then you do it. <coughs> Bad argument for the same reason. It's a purely individualistic argument, and that will not help us in communication of any kind, let alone cross-cultural communication. Bad argument number three. Descriptions will show the truth. We have long thought in translation studies that it's enough to go out and get data and look at what actually happens in the translations, and then we can show how much intervening actually goes on. Okay, that uh, there was a little descriptive translation studies project out, out there somewhere, uh, which is still there, and uh, uh, some kind of revelation knowledge will be created from this. That's not a bad answer, but my, my retort is, is the following. Uh, by my definition of intervention, I'm referring to things that are not, are te not textually available. Intentions are not textually available. Aims are not textually available. You're saying, well, how can I study them? How can I analyze them? I can't and I don't have to. Because ethics is a discourse, in this case, addressed to the people acting. Those are the people who will have the intentions and who will have the aims. They've got them. I don't have to pretend to have them over on this side analyzed on any textual basis. Ethics is not a, a question for quantitative textual research. And that's a very important point to make for those of you in translation studies. Ethics cannot be based on texts. Now I've lost all of you. I'm not even going to ask if you're with me. But there's an argument there, okay? Bad argument four. Tell translators to seek loyalty. This is Christian Nort's argument. Okay? You've got all these people out there. They're doing different things. Look for compatibility between them and be loyal to the author and the reader and your client and yourself and anybody else you can find at the same time. Answer, impossible. Possible, perhaps in a calm, peaceful world. But the world we're living in this year is not calm or peaceful. And I'm given to accepting conflict as a general situation of all cross-cultural communication. Don't tell me about loyalty. It's a lot harder than that. Next argument. Only work for people you respect and who respect you. That is, if you don't have mutual respect between all the participants in the Communication Act, don't do it. Good argument? Well, it falls by the same thing I just said. Because we're working in situations of conflict, I posit. Who was it that said that, that diplomacy is a continuation of war? Or, or whatever. Um, you know, tells me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you cannot assume mutual respect. You cannot just work for the people you happen to like. You can't go along and say, uh, here's a list of the baddies of the world, do not work for them, Don't, they will never get translated, and that will solve the world's problems. Uh, the baddies this week include, I don't know, I haven't checked recently, um, um, the CIA, uh, Walmart, um, um, who else have we got? Oh, Israel, too, yeah, this week. Okay, and it might be your country next week. Okay, conflict is no, nobody has a monopoly on conflict. Uh, not a good solution. You're going to have to work with people whom you will not totally respect and who will not totally respect you. 
you will also have to accept that respect can be a product of communication rather than a prerequisite. Why do we talk across cultures? Surely partly to create respect and trust and understanding. You cannot assume that there's a bliss of bad people and we're not going to talk with them or translate them. And you cannot assume to solve any problem that way. You know what I'm talking about. Good. You might know who I'm talking about as well. But, yeah. My final bad solution is um, that intervention is a question of opposing narratives. And I think uh, David in his talk will pick up on some of the narratives I'm talking about. Um, I've noticed it in your, uh, in your abstract. Yes. <laughs> um, th this is... I, I won't go into, in, in, into it in, in, in great detail, but it, uh, the problem here is that there's a kind of ideological closure. It, it posits that the, the conflict at stake is one of ontological narratives that are mutually exclusory, um, so that we will not work or, or we will alter the text of a certain person because, and I cite, they are the sort of person who or don't go along with that sort of translation theory because the meta-narrative of that theory is that you will make these decisions and get rich and die happy. Um, a narrative in its nature has ideological closure and exclusion. A narrative in its nature excludes some very important parts of cross-cultural communication, notably dialogue and exchange and openness to the unknown, that part of the other that is unknown, that is not incorporated in the narrative one possesses. Which leads me to my solution. Oh, there's one more bad argument, I'm sorry. Look at time. In, in this area, um, there are no human rights. In fact, there are no rights at all. There is no such thing as a right to information, or a right to a decent pay, or a right to good work conditions, or a right to embellish the text, or a right to be free of foreign intervention, or any right at all. Because the whole discourse of human rights has been well and truly shown to be a Western imperialist imposition. In the first place, uh, through Asian right to development and read, read the literature on from there, okay? I, I think uh, that's, we, we don't have a lot of people talking about rights. It tends to be there as, as, as it's sort of assumed that there is a right to something. But if you're serious about cross-cultural ethics, you cannot assume any rights. You have to move back to a Quentin Skinner Machiavellian frame. There are no rights. If there are, great, but I've no, no proof of any rights this week. Instead of rights, we just have interests which are conflicting and competing, but can cooperate. Why do people communicate across cultures? The only possible reason is to find mutual benefits, to find situations of cooperation, to find win-win situations. It's Adam Smith, you can find it there. I don't have to elaborate on the theory of cooperation, I hope, but it's the only way that you can think through these false solutions. Find an aim in cross-cultural communication that can lead to cooperation, and if you've got that one, intervene. I will now solve the problem of the peace map intervention. My uh, former student, Ahmad Ayad, who did this, when he first did this research, he was shocked that there were so many interventions going on. How could translators possibly do this and still be called translators? And that happens. Uh, they're not translators, problem solved, but come on, let's get real. They got paid for the job. That was... How could they do this? And he assumed, when he went into the text analysis part, that he was working with legal texts. He said, you know, if you're translating a contract, you can't change those things. We got back and started to think, well, wait a minute, these are not legal texts. What is this text? What is this roadmap? What is its function? 
what, what's it doing out in the world? It's a text as, that has to work as a basis for conversation, for dialogue, for future exchange. It's a point of departure. It's not a fixed text. And any intervention, the, most of the articles were added in a Palestinian newspaper, likely to get popular support for this initiative in the time the translation was carried out. If that aim is laudable, if that translation can get large segments of the population engaged in an act of cross-cultural communication like the Roadmap for Peace or any other peace initiative or any other act of cooperation, then it is ethically laudable in that situation for that purpose. I have now justified ethical intervention. I now have to write it up as a code of ethics, but <laughs> I'm sure you're much better at me than that. My final uh, comment is this. I, I, I'm trying to do work on... The boundary work is a really nice term. I think we should use more of that. The boundary work here affects the translation in, in many ways, um, but by shifting the ethical discussion to that level, I have to allow that there are many, many kinds of cross-cultural communication and many different things that mediators can do. And one of the, the, the consequences of my thought is that I've come to see that what we have to train are not actually just translators and just interpreters. We have to train people who can think critically about the situations in which they have to intervene. We have to train people who are going to be mediators in a broader sense that will be, will be unpopular with official ideologies. But it sort of ensues from the mode of thought that I've presented. That's one kind of boundary change that we might go for or might not. The second affects our own status within a, the academic discipline called translation studies. A lot of the best thought that I find in theories comes from what is badly and loosely called cultural translation. We have, in English language translation studies at least, an ongoing perplexity with a, a number of theorists who talk about translation in a sense that has nothing to do with texts. Migration is translation. The interpretation of the past is translation. The handing on of cultural heritage is translation. Museums are translation. Anthropology is translation etc. Cultural translation sort of brings together all those things. And I've been debating with myself about what to do with that new sense of the term translation. And I've published texts that say I don't like the metaphors. I like to have a relationship with a profession. I like to be training people to go out and, and produce texts. And I don't want to abandon that. But that's the place that the most insightful theory and helpful theory for this kind of intervention is being developed. And to that extent, I am starting to open up my own boundaries within the discipline. Thank you very much. <laughs>